It is June the 4th and we are starting to get the first signs of a true Ukrainian defensive developing with reports of dozens of large attacks on Russian positions, as well as hundreds of smaller probing attacks all across the southern front line. The Russians themselves are still pushing on Ukrainian defenses in several sectors, including the town of Marinka, where about 10 city blocks have fallen into Russian hands over the last few days. The Ukrainians appear to be recycling tactics from their successful offensive operations last year by putting pressure on the Russian army in two entirely different directions in hopes of splitting Russian resources and creating an opportunity. The Ukrainian army is starting to create major problems for the Russians within their own borders through shelling and military incursions into the Belgorod region. As the situation is coming more unstable, Russian Wagner mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin has identified another opportunity for political clout and offered the use of the mercenary force to defend the Belgorod border. Meanwhile, in the U.S., President Joe Biden has struck a deal with Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy to raise the federal debt ceiling and avoid a default, which certainly would have caused a global economic crisis. All of this in today's report. In my last video, I identified the fact that the summer fighting season was beginning to pick up and more violent clashes were beginning to take place more frequently all along the Russo-Ukrainian front. That can be seen even more clearly today with clashes taking place in the Belgorod, Kharkov, Lugansk, Donetsk, and Zaporozhye oblasts. We will f start with the updates from the Belgorod reg region and, and focus on giving a full frontline report. For several days now, for several days in a row now, there's been highly intense shelling in and around the Russian border town of Shebekino, a town with a population of around 40,000 people. According to the Russian media channel Rybar, the shelling has actually been concentrated around the bridges in the area, which signals that the Ukrainians intend to cut off the Russian forces in Shebekino from their logistics. This operation is shaping up to be less of a surprise attack and more of a long-game attritional operation to try and force the Russians back across the Rekha River and take control over Shebekino. Strategically for Ukraine, this gives them more depth to protect the recaptured or recently recaptured eastern Kharkov territories and would put a water barrier between them and the Russian army. What we are seeing is just a very similar thought process to what took place in the reca Ukrainian recapture of Kherson last year, just at a much smaller scale. But it remains to be seen if Ukraine can replicate the same success here, as there are many more river crossings that can be used by the Russians, along with the fact that the Rekha is a much less formidable river than the Dnieper, so crossings can be more easily built. The Ukrainians have now launched their second probing attack into the region in the last three days. This time, Russian media is reporting that anywhere from a platoon to a company-sized unit of the Ukrainian-aligned Free Russia Legion has entered into the southern parts of the settlement Novaya Tavoljanka. This has actually caused a very interesting development in Russian politics. Wagner mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, fresh off his victory in the city of Bakhmut, has seen the situa uh, situation as an opportunity to verbally attack the Russian government, making the claim that infighting among the Kremlin factions was destroying Russia. This is not the first time Prigozhin has attacked Russian political figures, especially those involved with the Russian military. Prigozhin has also made this statement to the public. In quote, if the Russian, if the Ministry of Defense does not stop the lawlessness that will conquer the territories of the Russian Federation in the near future, we will come to the Belgorod region and protect our Russian people. I emphasize we will protect our people, Russians, Dagestanis, Chechens, and ethnic Ukrainians. We will not wait for an invitation or and ask for permission. The only thing is that we will need ammunition. Without them, there is no point in coming. I believe that the behavior of Bogosian has led some analysts to think 
that he might be gunning for the job of Sergei Shorgu, the Russian defense minister himself. I do not believe this is out of the realm of possibility, but we will have to see how the situation develops further. Certainly interesting comments, uh, an interesting drama still surrounding the leader of the mercenary group. Moving to the Kupiansk sector of the front, despite the fact that the Russian army is dealing with assaults in Shebekino, just a couple hundred kilometers away, the attacks in the direction of Kupiansk continue. Some, some Russian sources suggest that the Russian army here has advanced another kilometer in the direction of Kupiansk, taking over more of the forest near Sinkivka. It is tough to tell the validity of these statements, and while we do not have proper mapping of these gains, we do have confirmation from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense that there is heavy clashes going on in the area. Along the Siversk front line in the area of Belogorovka and Sporne, the Russians continue to attack Ukrainian positions, but we have no word of any gains for the Russians in the area. I do have a map correction here, though. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in right here on Belogorovka so we can see. It appears at some point in the last two weeks after Russo-Chechen forces took over the small Belogorovka industrial zone, the Ukrainians launched a counterattack and at least partially dislodged Russian forces from these positions. It is not entirely clear if either side controls the industrial area at all at this point. It could just completely be destroyed uh, from recent images and drone footage. It looks like it's destroyed and it might just be in the gray zone. All right, moving on to the areas of Bakhmut and Avdivka, we do have some developments here. But before we get into the details of that, I would like to ask everyone to please consider hitting both that like and subscribe button, actions that are totally free for you to do, but are a huge help for me to grow the channel. Also, please consider hitting that bell icon so you do not miss the next update. In the area of Bakhmut, we have some news of clashes just to the south of town. I do not believe this is part of any kind of greater Russian offensive operation. It appears just to be general balancing of the front line. Of course, over the last couple of weeks or a couple of days, we've had Ukrainian attacks in the area as well. The recent claims from the Russian side is that they have pushed the Ukrainians back across the canal in more locations. Although I am unsure of the particulars of this instance, the Russians could once again be closer to Chasov Yar or the report could be talking about a different section of the front that we previously failed to adjust. It's really tough to tell. That's just the news from Bakhmut. In, in the area of Avdivka, after we got the report of the Russian advance on Novo Kalinove, it appears the Russians have taken a pause in this operation. There are no reports of fighting in the area today from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense nor the Russian media channels. It is possible that the Russian army has decided to not yet dedicate large resources to the operation on the Avdik Divka flanks in order to focus more on the capture of Marinka further to the south and repelling the Ukrainian attacks in Zaporozhye and Belgorod. The small city of Marinka, possibly now the longest running battle of the war, is the site of the largest Russian gains over the last two days. Ukrainian troops were forced to retreat in the northern leg of town, along with giving up a large chunk in the center of the city to an intense Russian storming effort over the last few days. Sources are claiming that Russia now controls 80% of Marinka and fierce fighting there continues. There is also information that Ukraine is attempting to counterattack in the area, although it is vague and I am unaware if they have had any success. Russian media mentions that their troops in Marinka have endured some intense artillery barrages and the Ukrainian attacks from the direction of Krasnogorovka. This is where I have marked the Ukrainian assault actions on the map. 
Possibly the most consequential and biggest battlefield development of the day is what appears to be a massive Ukrainian uh, offensive or reconnaissance in force effort along the southern front line. We have reports that many Russian-occupied towns from the Vugladar region all the way to Orekhiv have endured Ukrainian shelling and assault operations. I will start with the largest Ukrainian gains in the area of Vilka Novosilka. So we have mixed reports coming from the area, but I'm going to try my best to focus on what is reliable and try to determine the reality. So I have the blue shaded area marked as the ground retaken by Ukraine over the last 24 hours. And there is some overlap with the red shaded area, which is Russian occupied Ukraine. Reliable sources such as Syriac Maps confirms that Ukraine has definitely taken ground to the north of Rivnopil. While claims of Ukrainian capture of the towns of Novodarovka, uh, which is right here, and Neskuchny, which is on the outside of Nova of Veloka Novosilka, right here, uh, those claims are a little bit less certain. I'm going to get into that. But the original claim from Syriac maps was that the Ukrainian forces had captured both of these towns and overrun some Russian positions. But a Russian counterattack did occur um, and did not allow the Ukrainians to dig in, and they recaptured both towns. So Ukraine walked away with some gains, which are the areas that are not overlapping, but not the full extent of what they had originally conquered. Rybar, which is a strongly pro-Russian media channel, adds in some curious details, however. They claim that Ukraine also made the situation very difficult for Russian troops in the small town of Rivnopil, and at one point had launched assaults on Levadny and uh, Pryutny, which are marked down here further to the to the south from the direction of Novodarovka, which confirms that at some point in the last 24 hours, the town was captured by the Ukrainian army. Now, that that is the information I have. I'm not necessarily saying what's true, what's not, but we're going to get into a, a little bit deeper explanation here. So, you know, I am very unsure about the information of the Russians recapturing these towns. I don't know if that is accurate. But the information of how these events unfolded is interesting and almost exactly matches up with my previous analysis of the Zaporozhye front line. So the Russians are guarding the front uh, with weak, low-tier, non-mobile infantry units. Basically just rifle squads, uh, not a lot of tactics, not a lot of training. Uh, these troops are spread thinly and are meant to absorb the initial blow from any Ukrainian attack and call for immediate assistance. Meanwhile, stronger, better trained mobile infantry waits in the rear in response to any Ukrainian attacks. This means the initial confirmation that the Russian positions were overrun by Ukrainian assault groups is not surprising in the least. And the immediate reaction of Russia to counterattack is also not surprising. Of course, these events just happened, and I cannot say the front line I have marked here is, is, is accurate. We really don't know. But one thing I will say about the, uh, about the Ukrainians is that the information about hundreds of smaller probing attacks along the front line might bode well for them. By overloading the Russian defense and attacking in more places than uh, Russian motor rifle brigades can actually respond, Ukraine opens up an opportunity to confuse the Russians and potentially make a breakthrough. This is a similar line of thinking that the Russians use in their missile attacks on Ukrainian cities, where they try to overload and confuse Ukrainian air defense in order to achieve hits on targets. It's essentially applying that log logic to, um, you know, broad frontline assaults, just, you know, launch probing attacks in different areas, make the Russians think that's where the main attack is and then launch your bigger attacks in other areas. Um, if this is truly the Ukrainian offensive, I think we will start to see more of this. Uh, in addition to the largest concentrations of attacks near uh, Velika Novosilka, the Ukrainians have also probed the Russian line in the area of Vugladar and down the Arikiv Pologi Highway, the latter of which appeared to be a much stronger and serious attempt at a breakthrough. Hopefully tomorrow we will have an update on the situation here. Finally, 
a very important piece of geopolitical news. This one actually uh, originating from our or my home country, the U.S. So U.S. President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy this week inked a deal to avert a U.S. debt default crisis by raising the U.S. debt ceiling, a cap on the amount of borrowing that Congress can do to fund the U.S. government. Republicans had used the rapidly approaching funding crisis to try and get concessions out of Democratic lawmakers. Among those demands were a plan to cut deficit spending and bring U.S. government spending levels closer to what they were pre-pandemic, along with potentially cutting the amount of aid going to Ukraine. While Republicans did manage to achieve a marginal reduction in spending, the final bill did not seem to affect the U.S. effort to fund uh, the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian war effort. In fact, the most surprising concessions made in the bill was actually an increase in funding for the U.S. food stamp program and the approval of a pipeline in West Virginia. Now, admittedly, I am somewhat entertained at the prospect that the entire world economy was held hostage to get a pipeline built in the poorest state of America, but perhaps this is uh, biased on my part as it is my home state. Senator Joe Manchin, you beautifully corrupt person. Thanks for the jobs, guy. Sorry the rest of the world hates you now. It will be interesting to see the political fallout over this incident in the next couple of months. On one hand, Democrats are upset that Joe Biden negotiated with the Republicans at all, but they did at least get more funding for a vital social program. For the Republicans, however, they have to deal with attacks from the Democrats that, that they held the global economy hostage uh, in the first place, essentially for just a pipeline, while at the same time trying to soothe their own base, which is more skeptical about the Ukraine funding. All right, guys, that is all for me today. I want to thank everyone for, for joining and more from me next time.